Depending on where you are, I wish you a good morning or a good afternoon. My name is TJ and I'll be your moderator and your host for this afternoon's special ESI session on inclusive education in ASEAN, fostering belonging for students with disabilities. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, education systems provide students who are diverse learners and come from various economic backgrounds with the unique opportunity to learn skills for the future. It also provides an environment for students to come together and learn from each other. Creating inclusive education systems and environments should be a key focus for education policies, where opportunities abound for all students, including those with different physical and intellectual abilities to have the necessary tools to flourish. In that light, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, IRIA, partnered with Rubina Singh and conducted a study on inclusive education practices in primary and secondary schools in the ASEAN region and select countries in East Asia. So we are so happy this afternoon that we can bring everything together, as well as invite our panel of enlightening speakers to have a conversation with us. To start us off, I would like to first, you know, introduce and have um, Ms. Antonella Noya, the Head of Social Economy and Innovation at the OECD, to give us a re opening remarks via a video recording that she did. Good morning. Thank you very much for your invitation. I am really happy to be here with you today to share my thoughts on the links between social economy and disability. You might be aware that over uh, 1 billion uh, people on earth are impacted by some forms of disability. Uh, and uh, this has an impact not only on education, health, employment, but also on mobility, access to water and sanitation. And a recent Eurofound survey showed that in Europe, 20% people with disability are uh, unemployed against only 12% of people not having a disability and social economy can really be a solution to this issue. In fact, analysis show that social economy employs three times more people with disability than traditional business. So what is social economy? Social economy comprises uh, association, cooperatives, foundations and social enterprises, which are entities all driven by values of solidarity, uh, democracy in governance, and in which profit is not meant uh, to uh, become an element of personal enrichment, but is really meant to uh, be reinjected in the social purpose of the mission of the company, of the association, of the cooperatives or whatever. So social economy all over the world put people at the center of its uh, operational mode. This means that social economy can really support not only people with disability, but people who are marginalized. I'm very proud and happy to uh, announce that OECD has recently approved, adopted a recommendation on social and solidarity economy and social innovation. So this is a legal instrument, which doesn't mean that 
uh, the content of the recommendation is mandatory, but that the countries of the OECD, which have adopted the recommendation, have uh, the commitment committed uh, to implement it. So the recommendation is important because it is the first international agreed standard which provides a policy framework built around nine uh, policy areas, including institutional and legal forms, access to market, access to finance, and this will help policymaker to design and implement uh, public policies to support social economy. The OECD recommendation is available also for countries in the Asian continent, and we do believe that this can help social economy uh, foster and strive and therefore also uh, make uh, the life of people with disability easier. Thank you very much. Let me just say that again. I just want to thank you know Antonella for joining us um, and sharing her thoughts with us despite not being able to join us in person. For the next uh, in the opening remarks, I'm so pleased that we could have Dr. Adrian Gilbert, the first secretary of an Australian mission to ASEAN, to just share some thoughts with us. Adrian, please. Thank you, TJ. And thank you, uh, Rabina Singh, for all your work uh, on this study, Inclusive Education in ASEAN, Fostering Belonging for Students with Disabilities. And I acknowledge the area team for all the work you've put into this event. A very warm welcome to all panelists and participants today. We appreciate your presence virtually from various locations to join this special session, where we will learn more about the report, but also hear from our impressive panel of speakers. The Australian government has a steadfast and ongoing commitment to promote gender equality, disability and social inclusion through its foreign policy, strategy, economic diplomacy and development work. An estimated 1 billion people around the world live with disabilities. And that amounts to approximately 15% of the global population, with the world's highest rates generally found in developing countries. As quoted from the study, it suggests that about 43.1 million children with disabilities live in our region. The global COVID-19 pandemic has thrown up new challenges for governments and societies seeking to protect and improve the rights of persons with disabilities on multiple fronts, including access to basic needs, such as education. Students with disabilities have faced increased barriers in accessing quality education, which has become even worse during the pandemic, which has seen enrollment of students with disabilities fall. ASEAN, through its comprehensive recovery framework, is committed to building back better from the pandemic. And this includes ensuring that students with disabilities are not left behind. It's in line with the emphasis in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, on promoting inclusiveness and a greater sense of community across all aspects of ASEAN activity. Australia strongly endorses and encourages the growing emphasis area is placing on mainstreaming disability and social inclusion in its research and its outreach. These are not niche issues, but are essential to ensuring our region's recovery from the global pandemic is shared equitably by all. The study presents not only current practices of inclusive education, but also provides practical cross-cutting recommendations. And this is to help ensure that students with disabilities can exercise their right to quality and equitable education. I commend the authors for this important work and look forward to seeing many of its recommendations taken up by policymakers. I would also like to thank Aria and the team for hosting today's event, which Australia is pleased to be supporting. I hope you'll have a productive discussion today and I'm sure this will be rewarding and insightful going forward in ensuring inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. We will now jump straight into you know, this report that uh, we are all interested to find out more about. And let me just introduce you know, the person behind the report, Ms. Rubina Singh, who's the manager research and knowledge of Kite Insights, 
and the author of this era report on inclusive education. Rubina has practiced as a pediatric speech language pathologist for seven years in Canada and for one year in Cambodia at a social enterprise clinic. She has worked with neurodiverse learners and their multi-stakeholder teams made up of parents, educators, administrators, and other specialty professionals, such as psychologists and counselors. Rubina completed a Master of International Development from IE University and began, with, uh, began consulting with IRIA as an external consultant in October 2021. She believes that inclusion begins with a mindset and skill set to see disability not as a limitation, but a temporary barrier between a person and the environment. With effective support and strategies, ways can be found to communicate, engage, and include neurodiverse learners in the classroom. Through this work, a greater sense of belonging can be created for all students. Now, there is that QR code at the bottom of this page, you know, that you can scan to download a copy of the report. So please do that. But now, please join me to welcome Rubina. Rubina, over to you. Thank you so much, TJ, for that very warm welcome. Um, I want to, before I begin talking about this report, I just want to thank um, everyone who's been involved in putting this together, um, and including all of the participants uh, who are here today. Thank you so much for taking the time out to be here to, to take a deeper dive into the report and talk about what inclusive education really means. Particularly, I also want to thank Antona Lanoya, Head of Social Economy and Innovation at the OECD, and Dr. Adrian Gilbert, First Secretary Australian Mission to ASEAN, for giving your introductory remarks. Um, thank you also to Julia Ajmone Marston from AREA for her advice while writing this research paper. I also wanna thank the following people named on your screen with whom I had very insightful and engaging conversations, which really collectively helped me shape the focus of this research. I will start by saying, um, as we've talked about already, that inclusion began with a mindset and a skill set to see disability not as a limitation, but as a, a temporary barrier between a person and the environment. And with an open mindset, we can find effective strategies to help those around us to communicate, engage, and be active learners in the classroom. Through this work, we can together create a greater sense of belonging for all students and a cohesive society. And to reflect on what is the long-term goal here, the long-term goal of inclusive education is to support the development of students' academic and social skills so that they can be socially, politically, and economically engaged later in life. However, the reason why I'm here today is because we've seen that there's a gap between this vision and what's happening on the ground. Often students with disabilities are left out of the design of education systems, yet, as we've mentioned, we have an opportunity now to reevaluate our practices and evolve them to become more inclusive. And when we say inclusive education is for all students, this includes students who don't have disabilities as well. After all, education that is inclusive is, is truly just high quality education that increases social cohesion amongst all learners. In this presentation, um, we'll, we'll lay out the agenda. It will first provide some context to frame the situation on students with disabilities, touch on the commitments that are made in the ASEAN region, explore the term in inclusion in greater detail, often because it is misunderstood. Um, let's Then we'll go into redefining inclusive education and end by sharing how these challenges that we face in many ASEAN countries can be turned into opportunities, particularly in the post COVID-19 recovery period through uh, a targeted framework for action. So first we begin with some context. International reports suggest that there are 43.1 million children who are aged from zero to 18 years of age who have physical and or intellectual disabilities in East Asia and the Pacific. 
many of these children unfortunately do not attend school at all. Because of this absence from formal education systems, these children are also more vulnerable to entering the informal and often illegal job market, intermarriage while still being children themselves, and experiencing heightened levels of exploitation, violence, and poverty. Now the staggering um, figure of 100 million students in Southeast Asia um, and who have been affected by school closures and 260 million students in East Asia is, is quite a remarkable statistic. Unfortunately, UNESCO also estimates that at least 2.7 million will not return to school at all, in addition to the 35 million students in East Asia and Pacific who have dropped out. These numbers seem quite large and sometimes difficult to like, digest the gravity of what this really means. Um, but out of all students who are not returning to school, students with disabilities are more likely to remain out of school once schools fully reopen and which can perpetuate a cycle into poverty. In brief, I will just highlight some of the commitments that have been made across the ASEAN region that show very strong will to include students with disabilities in education systems. Um, from my research, I would like to highlight that all ASEAN member states aspire to create inclusive education systems, although there are various levels of commitments and policies that are being implemented at the individual country level. Overall, however, countries have made commitments to international and regional agreements, national frameworks, laws, and policies that promote inclusion, and importantly, the moral duty to uphold the human rights of persons with disabilities. These on your screen here, international and regional frameworks, are a part of the many documents that are important to keep countries accountable and aligned. And um, from this, from these commitments, I'd like to highlight the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025, as well as the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework as key documents that shaped this report. In particular, the ASEAN Community Vision 2025 has three pillars, political security, economic, and social cultural. Disability inclusion measures intersect all of these pillars. Therefore, an integrated approach amongst the three pillars will ensure that we have coordinated efforts between sectors, organs, and bodies to create a long lasting and sustainable change for students with disabilities. Despite these commitments, there's, as we've mentioned, variable progress on the ground. And one of the reasons I found in my research that might allude to why this is the case was because the definition of the word inclusion varies from country to country and in, across the region in general. Therefore, I wanted to take a moment now to redefine what this word means, as well as separate it from other words that it's often confused with, such as integration and segregation. So as we may already know, exclusion entails students are completely denied access to education. In this case, students cannot attend or register for school, or they are told that a teacher will only teach them at home. A segregated model of education means that students with disabilities attend schools, but are placed in a separate environment, such as a different class, or they only attend school for students with disabilities. So students who do not have disabilities do not attend these schools. Integration, on the other hand, implies students are in the school themselves physically, but the system of education delivery has not changed. Therefore, there's no individualized support. Teaching staff aren't able to meet the students' needs. And often the student with disability is uh, uh, assessed in the way that a student without a disability is assessed. And unfortunately, this can uh, show very negative results in their learning. So this last uh, type of system or situation that we'd like to get to is inclusion. So an inclusive system is one in which a student has access to quality learning from the mainstream curriculum that is adapted to individual learning needs and sometimes actually also includes adapted materials. So what we saw was the difference, the important difference between inclusion and integration, which are often the two words that are confused um, across the region and in general. 
Um, but what does a truly inclusive education system look like? Well, one of the components of a, an inclusive system include a long-term national or regional commitment that upholds the rights of students with disabilities so that they do not face discrimination. An inclusive system has certain domains that are explained further in the report, but in brief, I would mention these uh, domains here up on your screen, and they include whole system approach, uh, adaptation of the curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, teachers receiving sufficient and consistent support, a friendly learning environment, transitions are really important between grades and within activities, um, they must be effective, partnership with multi-stakeholders, including parents, and last but not least, an emphasis on a data and monitoring system. With these domains of inclusive education in mind, another overarching theme of inclusive education is the difference or nuance between equity and equality. Within inclusive systems, no two children with disabilities have the exact same learning needs. Equitable systems involve varied factors that allow students from different learning and cognitive backgrounds to learn together. An equitable system does not mean equal or the same learning methods, or even sometimes the same level of individualization of teaching. So it, it may vary from student to student. Uh, and this support can be used Rarely, it can be used sometimes or always for long-term intervention, depending on the disability. I also want to point out that this concept of equitable versus equal doesn't always apply just to students with disabilities, it really applies to all students. So while students with disabilities who are included in schools are reported to be healthier, can apply their skills to other settings, look forward to going to school, and are more likely to be civically engaged and employed later in life, it's true that students without disabilities have much to gain too. And so all students can broaden uh, skills such as their perspective taking skills, collaboration in creative ways, and they get to understand right from the classroom, what is the process of community building. So now I will go into some of the challenges that we're facing in doing this work. The first challenge to be diagnosed lies in the diagnosis, uh, sorry, the first challenge to be discussed is in the diagnosis of a disability. Um, it's important to highlight that while an apparent physical disability is more readily diagnosed and treated, meeting the needs of children with intellectual disabilities can be far more challenging and um, they can actually very often be excluded from education systems altogether, especially if that disability is mild and can be misunderstood, mislabeled. Uh, often children with mild intellectual disabilities are incorrectly labeled as lazy or unmotivated. It's important that children with disabilities are represented in the data to be, to, in order to build inclusive systems. Uh, what it's true that collecting sufficient data can be a challenge across uh, the region, but this is a, an area that we really need to support in order to better understand the quantitative landscape of not just the number of students with disabilities, but to understand in a holistic manner, what are the skill sets, what are the areas that we could support um, all students with. And also to note that data that's only collected in schools would miss children who are out of school. Therefore, perhaps household surveys can capture this missing data and provide a more realistic quantitative understanding of disability. If the student is diagnosed with a disability, a medical model of diagnosis can be quite limited in its ability to present strengths and weaknesses in the learning process. And once again, unfortunately, lead to a segregated approach to intervention education planning. When children are identified through screening services, data collection groups may, might not use internationally accepted frameworks or have access to the definition of disability used by, for instance, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
Therefore, in this report, I propose that the Washington Group UNICEF Child Functioning Module can be used to identify children who have difficulties that hinder their learning. And what's unique about this Washington Group is that the questions that are formed can inform a social model, model of including students to really form a holistic and coordinated policymaking across various ministries. Another fundamental challenge lies in the heart of the education system, which is teacher training. And across the region, what I've seen is variable teacher training quality and the consistency of pre-service and in-service teacher education. These are elements that are fundamental for inclusive education to really allow the, the teacher, the educator to form an open mindset that the student in her classroom, his or her classroom, who has a disability belongs there. And we need to be able to adapt our learning curriculum and our style in order to allow that student to blossom. Related to uh, teacher training, another common challenge across the ASEAN members states lies in the learner-centered versus teacher-centered approach to learning. Um, so a teacher-centered approach is one in which the teacher follows the curriculum quite rigidly and gives learning to students. And this is very common across the region. A learner-centered approach may uh, can no, no, not only increase student engagement in class, but also support universal design for learning and enhance critical thinking skills. A learner-centered approach has the added benefit of students learning how to advocate for their needs, including, really importantly, standing up for themselves against bullying. In this way, using this learner-centered approach, a competency-based curriculum can broaden the definition of success in schools and lead to better learning and social outcomes. For example, Vietnam's national curriculum is being revised to be closer to a competency-based model which can offer flexibility to educators in teaching methods and in student assessment. In taking this content um, in, into context and a group with including a greater understanding of inclusive education and some of the challenges that can become opportunities, I want to now go into the framework for action which suggests recommendations that are in alignment with the principles of the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. And these principles here on your screen are focused, balanced, impactful, pragmatic, inclusive, and importantly, measurable. The recommendations can be adopted in phases, uh, focusing on local and provincial development before moving to national implementation. And implementation of this framework uh, for action should also be very consistent with internationally recognized principles and commitments, such as what does inclusion mean according to the UNCRPD and to ASEAN's commitments to achieving the sustainable development goals. In this report, I provide recommendations to three groups of stakeholders, schools, ministries, and ASEAN member states. Uh, for a complete list of these recommendations, please see the report on ERIA's website. In this presentation today, I will share three key recommendations per stakeholder. First, I'd like to highlight that schools are integral to the community and the community building process. They are uniquely positioned to contribute to inclusive education as they can create a safe and welcoming learning environment and provide health, academic and social learning opportunities for current needs and for future needs. Here are the following recommendations for schools. As students return to school, reduce the academic expectations of what students should have been learning while they've been out of school. Schools should keep high stake assessments low. And this is particularly important as students have had quite a disruption in their learning and in their ability to learn new material. And what they've been doing is learning in different ways. So for a schools to assess them in academic ways that they may not have had uh, consistent uh, and necessary exposure to cannot be, does not maybe always capture the learning that they have been doing. Another recommendation for schools is to provide in-service professional development opportunities 
for all stakeholders, such as teachers and special education assistants to form communities of practice so that these professionals can engage and network with one another and, and talk about strategies that have been working for them and share best practice. A third recommendation is to involve parents of children with disabilities in their learning plans so that we can increase parent participation and provide home programming that is realistic, pragmatic um, for the stakeholders involved. An example of good practice in the ASEAN region is in Singapore, where more than 80% of students with special education needs learn in inclusive classroom settings in mainstream schools. It, this suggests a whole school system approach and attitude towards students with disabilities. And importantly, it includes resource support in order to get here. So next I will provide recommendations for ministries. Ministries are uniquely positioned as they set the guidelines and policies for public, private, religious, and secular schools, directly affecting the development of the seven domains of inclusive education. The first recommendation for ministries is to create interministerial dialogue and policy coherence to offer coordinated services to students with disabilities and their families in their own communities. In addition, it is recommended ministries promote disability inclusive and disability specific sports and cultural programs to integrate students with disabilities into community based activities that promote their health and their well being. These efforts will also go a long way at enhancing community awareness of disability and to fight the stigma that is around it. The third recommendation is to encourage early detection and early intervention for children with developmental delays and disabilities. This early detection is, is crucial as there is an, a window of opportunity in the first few years of life that allow um, intervention to be uh, much more impactful. For example, a, a good practice in the ASEAN region includes Indonesia's 2019-2024 Master Plan on the National Development of Inclusive Education, which aims to persuade see parents, teachers, and other school members to be more open to inclusive learning. And to this end, there has been more pre-service education teacher training um, that has been adopted to support a curriculum that uh, is, is really supportive of diverse learners in the classroom. Finally, I'd like to suggest uh, some recommendations for ASEAN member states, which can be implemented um, in primary and uh, secondary schools uh, so that they are more inclusive. The first is that the ASEAN Secretariat can form a coalition to encourage collaboration in, in bringing a whole of community approach to the post COVID-19 recovery period, promoting peer learning between countries and sharing good practices. The second recommendation is to enhance monitoring and evaluation of the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework's goals for inclusive education and to ensure mechanisms to imp implement these recommendations, uh, particularly broad strategy two, which includes students with disabilities and other vulnerable groups. The third recommendation is to ensure implementation of inclusive education goals across all ASEAN community pillars by discussing updates at the coordinating conference for the ASEAN political security community, the committee of the whole of the ASEAN economic community, community and the coordinating conference on the ASEAN sociocultural community. So while this research report covers inclusive education across primary and secondary schools, inclusive education is necessary at all levels of education from preschool to post-secondary school, in technical education and vocational training, it's truly an agent of change to encourage lifelong learning and full participation in social, economic, and political life. Inclusive education, again, is not just for students with disabilities, but can offer transformative learning opportunities for all students to build an inclusive, more resilient society. And learners must take um, must understand that the, sorry, leaders must also understand that the culture of persons with disabilities 
and they must be able to set a positive and holistic tone and support cross ministerial integration of inclusive practices beyond the education system. So from here, I just want to thank you for listening to this presentation. And now I turn the mic over to TJ to continue this webinar. Thank you so much, Rubina, for sharing um, you know, so succinctly all the efforts that we put into the report. We want to go into conversations right now. You know, we have invited you know, a few distinguished speakers to be with us. And I would like to introduce them before we go into our panel discussion. We have Dr. Darren Chua, inspirational speaker and empowerment coach of the Mindset Transformation Clinic. You know, Dr. Darren Chua graduated from the University of Singapore with a medical degree at 24 years old in the year 2000. His goal then was to complete his houseman and continue his medical career towards neurosurgery. However, in that year, he suffered a near fatal stroke that left him half paralyzed over the right side of his body, unable to articulate and unable to see his right visual field. Thankfully, his cognitive strength was left intact. Hence, he was still determined to pursue his journey towards doctoring. However, in the three years that followed, you know, through intense rehabilitation, um, it was unfortunately determined that he could not practice because he was still not very mobile. And as he continued working as a healthcare administrator, that was when he realized that his strength was not behind a desktop, but towards direct interaction with people whom he can impact. After finishing his master's, he started Porter's Clay Education and subsequently he launched the Mindset Transformation Clinic where he trains adults on mindset shifts to help people attain peak performance at work and in life. And believing in his own motto of disability is only in the mind, he went on to become a para-athlete and won a gold for Singapore at the 2015 ASEAN Games in the sport of wheelchair table tennis. Now, he has also completed a full Spartan race. And his current new sport is in wheelchair tennis. One to give back to community, he volunteers his time as a board member in a few NGOs and also an ambassador with pe for people with disability. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Darren. And then we have also with us, Dr. Wong Ziping, Associate Professor, School of Education from the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Now, Dr. Wong trained as a speech and language therapist and is now Associate Professor at the School of Education. Focusing on special and inclusive education, her research aims to understand how children who are neurodevelopmentally diverse acquire early language and literary skills through interactions with the people around them. By understanding how human de development interacts with the ecology, she is passionate in innovating inclusive teaching and learning approaches to improve learning access, well being, and quality of lives of young children from marginalized children in low resource contexts. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And our final panelist is Dr. Roger Chow Jr., who is currently the Assistant Director, Head of Education, Youth and Sports at the ASEAN Secretariat. Since 2013, he has been engaged in the international education development sector in various capacities in various organizations, including UNESCO, UNICEF, the European Commission, and the British Council. Dr. Chow has published um, in commissioned international reports, academic journals, and edited volumes, and international media on regionalization and interna internationalization of higher education, teacher education, recognition of higher education, and 
Industry 4.0, as well as refugee education. He has a PhD on Asian and International Studies from City University of Hong Kong, a European Master's in Lifelong Learning, Policy and Management. And, you know, he has also a Master's of Education in Mathematics from the University of Philippines. Dr. Roger, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's my pleasure. I want to go straight into, you know, the conversation that we have um, planned for this afternoon. And I will start off with um, Ziping. You know, my first question to you would be, what is the breadth of empirical evidence on inclusive education in ASEAN? If you could share your thoughts with us, please. Thanks, TJ. And thanks, Ariane Rubina, for um, the opportunity for me to be here in this meaningful session and discussion today. So talking about research, what is the breadth of research that we have at the moment? I think it wouldn't be a surprise to everyone if I say there currently isn't a lot on inclusive education um, in ASEAN at the moment. Um, research evidence is emerging. And if we look at the types of evidence that's out there, um, we can see the trend of these types of evidence is quite the same as the trend that we see globally. So in 2019, um, Antonio Emer published a systematic review that um, looked at the types of research on, on inclusive education done from 2002 to 2016, um, mainly from the English speaking countries or the Western countries. And um, the, the systematic review included papers published in the English language. So from that particular paper, it was shown that 93% of the papers that were published from 2002 to 2016 were actually focused on attitudes of stakeholders towards inclusive education. Um, there was a focus on theories that support the effectiveness of inclusive education, um, a focus on recommendations, literature review on inclusive education. When it comes to understanding intervention, how effective interventions are during this period, there's only about 5% of um, papers were actually focused on the effectiveness of intervention. So if we look at the biggest, um, uh, one of the biggest breadth of papers that's out there, attitudes of stakeholders, and obviously attitudes of teachers towards inclusive education is one that we see quite commonly, including in ASEAN. So what do we know about attitudes of teachers right now? We know across the world, including in ASEAN, um, we are affected by our culture. We are influenced by culture. However, we know that teachers, um, educational stakeholders in general, do want to support students who have disabilities. We want, we know and we acknowledge that it's important for them to have education. Education is not just important to the individuals, but to the country, to the community as well. However, um, from the studies in ASEAN and in other low resource countries, we can see that there is perhaps not enough understanding of what inclusive education is. So just like what Rubina has reported earlier, inclusive education, um, the understanding of this could also be extended to being seen, uh, to seeing inclusive education as um, integrated education, as um, segregated ed education, or ex excluding some of these students from schools. Um, and there is a misunderstanding that by having these other systems other than inclusive education, when students with disabilities are educated separately from those without disabilities, we are actually benefiting them and benefiting the society more than having them in inclusive classrooms. So this comes from this lack of awareness about disabilities, about inclusion, um, lack of policies. Policies are being developed at the moment, but what the stakeholders are um, wanting more 
um, is clarity and more details in policies, especially on how to implement inclusive education. And um, the other obvious lag in the research data that has been generated so far is um, lack of resources. So all of these are interconnected, this lack of understanding about what inclusion is and what it can actually do to support not just students with disabilities, but to the country um, stems from these different issues that countries in ASEAN are facing. Lack of awareness, lack of resources, um, and lack of clear policies or detailed policies. Thank you so much, Zipeng. Uh, indeed, I think there is a greater need to increase um, and to address these few areas of light that you just shared. Um, to move along to Darren, you know, um, persons with disabilities are often seen as the other. What is the role of language and attitude in making a shift towards inclusion? What is stopping us from creating an inclusion attitude in education systems? Because I think this, this will help to address you know, the part of lack of awareness uh, in this direct piece. Sure, definitely. Um, first off, can I just now uh, thank you for this invitation for this uh, panel discussion. According to uh, Rubina's paper, uh, can I just congratulate Rubina on a very well done paper? I, I read it and I thought it was just fantastic. Um, there is counter, currently about um, 240 million uh, students who are disabled, and I believe that this number is an underestimate. Um, if we look at this number alone, uh, people with disability or students with disability, just by using the word students with disability, people with disability, we are already creating a subconscious divide between people who are able and people who are physically unable. And, and, and usually, um, as somebody who is a speaker, as somebody who is a coach, um, the words that we use um, is very, very important. And which is why it's very important to understand that consciously our knowledge and our understanding ultimately drives our subconscious wisdom, our subconscious attitudes. And so which is why I've always believed that this word, people with disability, students with disability should be better improved. And I think a better word would be people with different ability. People with different ability, because ultimately, if you think about it, all of us, TJ, all of us are actually people with different abilities. Um, so I, I am a member of the National um, Table Tennis uh, Group. Uh, we represent Singapore. Uh, uh, in the sport of wheelchair table tennis. And, and, and actually I can right now um, very humbly can challenge anybody in that sport. And I think I can give a good fight. But, but that is because I am playing in my own uh, um, arena where I can perform well. And so I believe that everybody can perform well if we are placed in the same uh, arena where we can perform. And so I believe the words, the language that we use are very important in trying to empower students. And so that is uh, one thing about, about the words that we use. The other question that you are asking, which is about uh, what is stopping us? What is stopping us from creating this uh, inclusive attitude? And I think this is a very, very good question. And my answer to that question is simply nothing. Actually, nothing is stopping us. And yet, in that same breath, I would say that everything is stopping us. And, and that is because ultimately, right, what is really stopping us is the courage to do the necessary things that we have to do. And what I mean is this, uh, we, have, we, we, we know what to do. We know we have to develop inclusive education. We know we have to uh, help the people. But the thing is, nothing is stopping us except our courage to do it. And what this means is that the minute we lack the courage to do what is needed, everything is stopping us. Um, and the thing is, the thing that's stopping us is not so much about the act of trying to uh, 
policy making. It's not so much about policy making, but it is really about our ideation, about our imagination, about our conceived ideas, about how to help people with disability, how to help people with different abilities to really to shine at their highest level. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that every individual person in society can perform at their very best. Thank you so much. You know, indeed, um, power in the words that we use. And I like what you share, people with different abilities and the courage to just do it, you know, to, to dare to be an agent of change. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, Roger, you know, how then can policies be better implemented at a country level? You know, if you could share some thoughts, please. Uh... Okay. <clears throat> um, the, the translation between policies and uh, <clears throat> directives to actual effective implementation is always a problem. However, it requires not only political will or statements, it requires um, buy-in from multiple stakeholders. It requires resources, uh, not only financial, but also human resources or rather um, increasing capacity of um, the, the, the people on the ground. Um, it's not just, uh, it's mostly the people on the ground that actually implements policies. Inclusive education uh, is mostly undertaken in schools. Uh, although the government frameworks, a national or regional level helps, um, but it's the, the teachers, the school administrators, even the, the, the students in relation to how they engage with um, students with disabilities. Take note, when I say students with disabilities, that includes learning disabilities, um, not just uh, physical disabilities. Okay, um, so as such, the concept of uh, inclusive education needs to be advocated so more people understand what inclusive education is um, because there is a misconception of what inclusive education is. Um, getting persons with disabilities or persons with um, learning disabilities or those that are slower um, than, the, than the, their peers, um, getting them to school, putting them in a separate classroom, um, sometimes these are considered learning disabilities, but um, it's different. And even um, people in um, the average student, uh, as, as uh, David mentioned earlier, um, have different learning styles. They have different paces of learning. So we have to consider that when we really consider inclusive education. And then last but not the least, uh, our first speaker, Dr. Wong mentions something very significant. The lack of, res uh, the lack of research, particularly on the effectiveness of implementation or even the experimentation of new um, implementation um, strategies and, um, and projects or initiatives uh, focus on um, inclusive education. We should not only look at how teachers, how a community or other students look at students with disabilities, okay? We have to look at how projects how our national or regional strategies and directives are incorporated and what are the resources needed. And most of all, changing, I mean, Rubina mentioned something. Inclusive education starts at the mindset and cultural settings without changing uh, how we see um, persons with disabilities and persons with learning disabilities as well. Um, then we cannot call it inclusive education. Thank you so much, Roger. Advocacy, paradigm shift, yeah, very important indeed. Um, Rubina, do you have any thoughts that you may want to share you know, after our speakers have shared in, in just this first round of discussions? Sure. I uh, just want to share that all of these thoughts are so insightful and integrated. In, in this conversation. The thing that I that keeps coming to mind across all three of our panelists today is what is the importance of data and collecting data for students who have physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and understanding uh, the actual 
process of collecting data can create a bias in, towards students who, who present uh, differently. So the language that's used in the data collection method, the methodology and the robustness of collecting the data, and then is integrating that data into policymaking and seeing the results or seeing the outcome and impact of these interventions. There's, uh, there's much work to be done in the use of data uh, in this area. So that was a cross-cutting theme across all three panelists. Thanks so much, Rubina. Um, to our participants, you know, if you have any questions for our speakers, please do type them into the chat box and the Q&A chat box so that um, during the Q&A session that we have, you know, we can address these questions that you have. I'd like to move back to Dr. Wong. You know, um, I think you kind of briefly shared about it just now. But what research efforts do you think you know, uh, researchers and leaders in ASEAN should prioritize in order to support the development of uh, inclusive education in the region? Thanks for that question. I think um, quite a bit of this question has already been answered by the panelists here as well as by Rubina's um, report. And I'm very much in agreement with them. I think it's now time to measure actions. So we know what's lacking, we know what's happening on the grounds, we know what the challenges are, um, but it's time for us to measure what's working and what's not working in what we are currently implementing in the different countries in ASEAN. So this can be from multiple levels, what's working in interventions when we work with these students. Um, are we supporting them enough and are we helping them to actually learn, retain learning and apply what they've learned in the future? Um, then it comes to classroom practices. So do we know enough about what's effective when it comes to teaching students in the classroom? Do we know how to set up an inclusive classroom that is safe for students to learn, an inclusive classroom that is democratic for students to own their learning and um, to decide on what they want to learn at the same time? Um, do we have practices that support teachers to develop their confidence, um, their teaching efficacy and their teaching agency to want to keep supporting these students? And do we um, know enough about what's working and what's not working in the whole school environment? So this takes us back to the nine commitments that Rubina has identified for the country's the whole school approach. Um, what kinds of school policies support inclusive education? And um, what are the lacks that we need to put in school policies to support inclusive education, not just for students um, with disabilities, but for everyone, their peers, teachers, parents, and other staff members of the school. So I think we now it's time for us to generate these kinds of data so we can keep improving on um, the, the practices. And the data will also help us to innovate practices that suit the context because we know um, contexts are very much influenced by culture. So we know we need that kind of data as well. Um, UNICEF outlined three types of very important purposes when it comes to implementing inclusive education. So that's the education case. So this refers to everything you need to know about what supports inclusive, sorry, effective inclusive education. That's the economic case. So we also need to bring data to show us that when we implement inclusive education, we are not depleting or, or putting in a huge amount of resources just for one group of students. We are actually supporting everyone. And um, there is a return of investment. So we need data to show this so we can continue to pump resources to support inclusive education. And we also need data to help us 
to show that inclusion um, will help with the social case and what what kind of practices will help us to identify exclusion because when we talk about inclusion obviously it is about stopping exclusion and stopping discrimination in the classroom and at all levels so i think um, it, it's a very exciting time there's quite a bit for us to to do in terms of the types of research that we need to prioritize and the types of data that we need to support everyone in the region. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Indeed, um, I think much more needs to be done. A lot more data needs to be collated so that we know what can be done. Um, you know, in, in looking at students who are still in the system, in the education system, you know, Darren, I want to just hear from you. When they graduate, what do you think are the biggest barriers you know, that students with disabilities or different abilities continue to face, especially when they're looking for work? Um, does the increased awareness then make much of a difference? Yeah, perhaps if you could share some thoughts, please. Sure, definitely. Well, um, according to, based on the question, uh, what is the biggest barrier? Actually, I think there are two big main barriers that uh, students as well as people that is in the system, in the education system that needs to be wary of. And I think the first would be about mindsets. Um, mindset of the student, as well as mindset of the educators as well. You see, what I mean is people with different abilities, sometimes uh, they just accept what is given to them. Uh, in other words, having been through the education system, uh, they have been told that, you know, they go through a vocation uh, education system, and then they they are told that okay, they can only do this or they can do that. And, and, and usually uh, uh, students with uh, different abilities, because they have been taught and trained in that manner, they believe that is all that they are. They believe this, that is all that they can be. But I think it is very important that, that at this juncture, especially in this 21st century, we need to break, help them break free from this fixed mindset. You know, students used to do, students used to go to school to be educated and employed for, for a job. Nowadays, students go to school to be educated and, and to be empowered so that they can be deployed, so that they can be use their talents to then to empower and help society. So I think this is a shift that we also need to help our students with different abilities to understand and to feel empowered that despite is it either physically or, or, or intellectually uh, um, perhaps uh, uh, unable, but they we can still be able to be a, a power of good to society. Uh, the other thing is we need to dis distinct between doing the right thing, which I think is the system doing the, having a good structure versus doing things right, which is really about the education system, creating support for the students. Because um, what is more important nowadays is really for us to make sure that we have the support for the students to flourish and to grow. Um, it is not so much about the structure anymore, but it is really about helping to give the support so that they can shine, so that the students can shine and really to flourish and to show that you know the talents that they have in them the gifts that they have in them can still be exploited and, and can still be uh, can be can still be used rather. And the final question is of course about the um, whether or not there is this understanding of uh, whether or not they can be making use of uh, make a difference, right? I think that was the question that you were yeah. saying. Yeah, I think I, I think everybody uh, in society can make a difference. Right now, it is about whether we have the courage to actually to help them to do so. Okay, thank you so much. You know, I like what you shared about doing the right thing versus doing things right, especially where we are right now, you know. Um, and, and very aptly in looking at this, you know, if we move it up to a regional level, um, I want to check with Roger. What, what do you think is the role of cross-country collaboration um, and can the region support you know initiatives to inspire um, and to support one another you know bring about this mindset change this paradigm shift roger please 
uh, I've always believed in regional cooperation and collaboration. Um, that's one thing. And in relation to inclusive education, um, I believe that's knowledge sharing, sharing of initiatives, data, and what works and what doesn't work um, is something always um, positive. It, it provides evidence for um, support towards building and developing um, national and even regional um, strategic plans. Um, sometimes resource sharing, uh, particularly for regional research and uh, cross-country comparison um, are usually done at collaborative uh, regional levels. Um, let, let's take ASEAN and what we've done. Um, ASEAN has an ASEAN working group on out of school youth and children, uh, out of school children and youth. Um, we've had uh, working group meetings uh, where the various ASEAN member states talks about what they've done at country level, put in uh, proposals uh, which will be implemented at regional level. Um, of course, uh, depends if we get funding at national level or regional level or dialogue partners. Uh, that's another story. But there is an ongoing dialogue. Um, there, Malaysia is working towards uh, data gathering, um, primarily for out of school children and youth. Um, Thailand put uh, place a proposal for advocacy and communication strategies. Uh, the Philippines is coming out. Uh, well, no, we're st we're still waiting for it uh, <clears throat> uh, for for uh, implementation and. Uh, moving it forward, but a basic education equivalency framework uh, focusing on uh, out of school children and youth. So these initiatives, although um, put forward by um, one or even two ASEAN member states, will be developed uh, to a more um, regional focus uh, where ASEAN member states actually get to learn from each other and then develop policies and implement. And at the same time, um, undertake capacity building. Um, uh, one of the, um, I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to add to Dr. Wong's uh, comments uh, on data. One of the things I have been looking at um, and, and, and at the development sector is empowerment at the grassroots. Essentially school-based management uh, allows for flexibility and contextualization. Um, of the various challenges and contexts. When we're talking of inclusive education, uh, Dr. Wong mentioned that um, context is different, culture is different, and even in a country, even uh, within the country, the various regions, uh, provinces, cities, or even the rural areas, villages are totally different. So the concept of um, empowering the schools, school leaders, and utilizing um, school-based management not only for um, implementing um, initiatives for inclusive education, but also for data gathering, because the data that we actually need are not only national data, we need disaggregated data, focus on teaching and learning, challenges um, when we, uh, challenges of getting students uh, included in the teaching and learning process and providing them opportunities for learning. Um, Darren mentioned something very important. It's a mindset. The student, not only the peer students, but also the students themselves with disabilities in one way or the other. Take note, I believe that each and every person has a disability in different contexts. I think I have one. Everyone has one. We just probably don't know. So at the end of the day, we need to change the, the students with disability saying, um, I'm not at par with everyone else. Who knows? You may be lacking something or you may be slow in one aspect, but you may be better in other aspects. We need to build courage. We need to build their self-confidence. The problem is society per se um, fic uh, has this culture of looking at people um, with disabilities uh, and think that, okay, they can only do so much. Darren's statement in terms of empowerment is something we should actually aim for, that everyone with disabilities, without disabilities, has the power and should be given the opportunity to learn what they want so that they just don't look for the jobs, they just don't uh, do um, entrepreneurship, 
but also contribute to society at various levels, local, national, regional, or even global. Thank you Thank so you. much, Roger. Thank you very much for your passion, you know, that has just come across so evidently. Uh, we talk about the work that has been done at the collective regional level, how it's trickling down to the grassroots. And at the end of the day, the mindset shifts that need to take place, but more importantly, the empowering, the empowering at different levels, you know, of society, um, of the system. Thank you so much. You know, I will now want to hand over um, the remaining time very quickly to Lida uh, from Iria, who will manage the Q&A. And while she's doing that, you know, if for the participants, if you have any questions, it's still not too late to put it into the Q&A chat box. So Lina, over to you. Thank you very much, DJ. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to all of the speakers and Rubina for a very insightful discussion. Um, it seems that our audience is dive in passionately to the discussion and there is only one question for all. Um, this is from Damanik. I believe it's an Indonesian. And the question is, if I may sum up, it might be answered implicitly by all of the speakers, but uh, to gather all of the speakers explicit answers, maybe if I may sum up, the question will be, uh, in promoting an inclusive education ecosystem, it requires the interconnected pattern between communication and relationship amongst the stakeholders. As Rubina said that public-private partnership is also important. So in the progress of achieving ASEAN community vision by 2025, so how each of your perspective or what can more to be done to foster a systematic inclusive education ecosystem, uh, especially in ASEAN? So perhaps uh, Dr. Roger, uh, this question uh, might be addressed first to you. So over to you, Dr. Roger, thank okay. you. Um, to date, there are a lot of declarations focused on out of school youth and children, inclusive uh, and enhancing participation and uh, empowerment of uh, persons with disabilities, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, which include the rights for children, women, all those things. The, the challenge is not the declaration. The challenge is actual implementation. The implementation has always been a problem, not only in ASEAN, but in most countries in the world. In the development sector, you look at uh, strategies. Effective implementation is really problematic. Okay, Communication advocacy is something that really works, uh, but just advocating doesn't work very well. We need to put resources, we need to build the foundations, and actually we need to build communities that actually work towards uh, goals such as inclusive education. If you build communities, you build champions uh, at local levels. Take note, I'm saying not saying national levels, I'm saying local levels. Then we get things work, um, we get things to move forward. Um, of course, there will be challenges and the champions uh, for inclusive education uh, would have uh, to build their own network and support. Uh, of course, hopefully, and we just and, and if the government supports uh, not only in terms of uh, financial, but also in terms of uh, capacity building support uh, through the local government agencies. Take note, not just one, not just education, but across all sectors. Because when we talk about inclusive education, it's not just going to school. It's about healthcare. It's about nutrition. It's about um, um, peace and security in the locality and, and, and all, all these things. Um, education cuts across all sectors. And for us to be truly inclusive, we need partnerships, not only in public and private partnerships, but also across public agencies, different sectors. Yes, I, I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. So uh, promoting interconnected cooperations in the cross-cutting sectors, communications, building community from the grassroots level, both from national and local level is crucial. So um, the uh, maybe Dr. Sef Peng Wong would like to answer or give perspective on this. Over to you. Thank you, Doctor. Sure, thanks. Um, 
So we're talking about transitioning from a more traditional approach of education to the inclusive one. Um, I, I suppose, I hope I understand this correctly. Um, and maybe I can offer my perspective on one group of stakeholders and that's the, the teachers. Going back to data that we have right now, when we talk about challenges um, on the implementation of inclusive education, one of the challenges that teachers, educators often say is we don't have the support, we don't have enough resources and therefore we need more from, from the top from the administration, from, from the leaders. Yes, I, that's, I guess, is, is a valid and rightful um, demand. However, we know this demand may not always be fulfilled that easily because of many reasons, political climates, um, national agenda, and, and all different reasons. Therefore, it's also important that going back to empowerment, that we develop teacher agency among the educators, which means when it comes to developing teacher teacher agency, um, teachers own this this will that yes, I do want to support inclusive education. I want to make this work, and therefore I'm going to initiate this communication with the professionals around me, with other teachers. Mainstream school teachers can work with special educational needs teachers, and there will be a share of knowledge between these two groups of teachers, working with parents and regarding parents as the expert of their children and teachers as the expert of teaching and how can we um, and uh, try to understand and work out how we can actually marry these two types of activities when it comes to supporting the students in our classroom, um, communicating with other stakeholders, with the community, understanding what the community needs um, when it comes to helping everyone to be inclusive and including those who have been marginalized and what schools and teachers can start doing. So communication that is arranged systematically and regularly, yes, that's, that is very important because you just can't assume that the um, stakeholders, educational stakeholders know what to do. So going back to if there's a policy that could support us, that is great. If there isn't, then um, echoing what Rubina has identified in her report, developing um, professional learning communities that will help us to develop these kinds of systematic communication is another way for us to move forward actively and for us to feel empowered, to be empowered in um, this, this movements of supporting inclusive education. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Serpengum. So developing professional community, whole system approach into the educational system is crucial. And last but not least, Dr. Darren Chua, please over to you. Thank you. I think you're mute, Dr. Darren. First, first off, I just want to say I, I agree completely with what Dr. Roger and what Dr. Zhu has said. In addition, I would just want to say that um, other than formal curriculum development, I think trying to have informal gatherings, in, informal project work, whereby you have students, uh, inclusive education, in other words, people who, students who are so-called normal, students who are with, 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 with different abilities, all come together for simple project work, for for even a simple barbecue, you know, where everybody can come together, plan the barbecue together, uh, just a simple project together, no need to be very formal, but just to enjoy time of each other. I think that is also one of the key, key ways for, 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 for students to grow and to learn together. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Derendra, and thank you very much to all of the panelists. I uh, I personally hope this uh, kind of webinar and the research that Rubina has been conducted will be uh, fostered inclusive uh, ecosystem in ASEAN, especially for persons with disabilities. So perhaps it is the end of the webinar. So before that, I hand it over to TJ. Thank you very much. So on behalf of Yuria, especially the ESI Knowledge Lab, you know, but we want to thank our speakers, our panelists for joining us. Uh, big thanks for, to Rubina you know, for really putting the whole thing together. Um, and also for our participants for joining us this afternoon. 
you know, if anything that I would want to be able to, in a sense, ask you to take back with you, it's really take back the passion that has been really emanating from our speakers this afternoon. Take it back to where you are. And, you know, like uh, Roger was sharing, bring it all the way down to the ground, to the local level, you know, and start something, just do it. Because we, for, for initiatives, we don't have to always wait for the government uh, or government agencies to start doing something. I think every one of us, we can play our part to do something, to bridge the gap, to bring about a change in mindset and culture, and really to be part of the empowering journey. So on behalf of everyone, the speakers and all, we want to thank you. Have a good afternoon and be safe. Goodbye. Thank you.